In this roundup of the week, we learn that data and research are obliterated if they tell us things that we don't want to hear, the world wakes up to how vulnerable it's made itself to communist China, and leading figures on the left get cancelled for signing a letter calling for the end of cancel culture. My name's Malin Baker, this is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the tournament in an empty stadium that is 2020. I hope you're well and dodging the virus. So last week I made a prediction that we would soon begin to see an uptick in the death rates in the recent surges in the southern United States of COVID-19. Because although the new cases started with a younger age group that was largely not likely to develop life-threatening illness, it surely wouldn't be long before the infectious people in that age group infected older people. It was one of those predictions I would really like to have gotten wrong, but it seems so bleeding obvious I couldn't quite see why everyone wasn't just stating it as inevitable. Sadly this week we're now seeing the first signs that in this case I didn't get it wrong. Florida, California, Texas all now starting to see the first signs of an upward trajectory in deaths. Now, of course, we don't get the demographic data, which is really frustrating, but I'm assuming that in all those cases, the average age of those infected is rising significantly. And we do know that for Florida. A couple of weeks ago, Sean Hannity was quoting data that showed the average age of new patients there was 21 years old. According to the Florida Department of Health, that is already now up to 37 years old. And that, for me, was the thing that so heavily implicated the Black Lives Matter protests as kickstarts to these surges. Events where large numbers of people gather together, often with non-existent social distancing, often but not always without masks, and predominantly young people. Because where we've seen the virus spreading, just because of people going about their normal lives, going to beaches, going to bars and whatever, we haven't seen that young age profile. Which, you know, isn't that surprising, because older people do all of those things, maybe not in as great numbers. But the fact that it started young and now that it's in general circulation is getting older faster, for me, confirms the proposition. Unless you can point me to other reasons why that age group suddenly became the focus, I have to come to the conclusion, not least because there's clearly a determination by media and politicians not to talk about it. Unless it's Donald Trump. They're very keen to talk about that. We had the exciting news this week from Tulsa that the County Health Department Director, Dr Bruce Dart, said that 261 confirmed new cases on Monday and 206 more on Tuesday were more than likely significantly fed by the Trump rally. This in spite of the fact that the Health Department's policy is not to publicly identify individual settings where people may have contracted the virus. Somehow that policy can be disregarded in this case. And this in spite of the fact that Tulsa and other parts of Oklahoma have seen ongoing Black Lives Matter protests and those are not mentioned at all. As we said before, the virus does not care about your politics. Gather people together into a big crowd in the middle of a pandemic in an area where there hasn't yet been enough of an outbreak to create herd immunity and you're going to get infection. Did that happen at the Trump rally? Why wouldn't it? Did that happen at the Black Lives Matter protests? Why wouldn't it? What would be interesting if we want to know the truth or at least to get some evidence that gives us clues to the truth. It's never a simple thing to interpret, don't get me wrong. What would be interesting would be to see if the age profile of the surge in Oklahoma around Tulsa at that beginning point was older than those for everywhere else where there's been one. Because that should follow, shouldn't it? Not that many youngsters as a percentage in that Trump crowd. If it contributed, you would expect to see the difference. There have been Black Lives Matter protests all over the place. There was only one Trump rally. The week before the Trump rally, there had been BLM demonstrations in Tulsa and in other places. There was already an uptick in cases, which were again described as disproportionately driven by people under the age of 35. So that should have changed radically, shouldn't it? A couple of weeks after the rally, there should have been a statistically significant change in the age range. 
I'm asking the question. I'd assume that it did. The question is, why are the news outlets covering the speculation that the Trump rally will add to the cases while still steadfastly refusing to acknowledge the completely obvious fact about the other cause? In the event, it turns out at least somebody has been asking. And because this has become a partisan issue, which is stupid. I mean, how can a pandemic be a partisan issue? But anyway, because it has become a partisan issue, it was Fox News that asked the question. And they got officials in Los Angeles and Miami-Dade County to acknowledge that the BLM protests may have led to an increased spread of the virus. Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, two days after saying there wasn't any conclusive evidence, did an about turn and said that the public health director does think that some of the spread did come from our protests. In Miami-Dade, the medical team advising Mayor Carlos A. Jimenez told the mayor that, based on information in local emergency rooms, the protests were a contributing factor to the spread of the virus, along with our community letting its guard down and not social distancing or wearing masks as mandated, graduation parties, house parties and restaurants illegally turning into clubs after midnight all contributed to the spike. So there you have it. The first couple of admissions. Now, there is no reason why. If that's the case in those locations, it's not the case elsewhere. The frightening thing here is that the authorities, mainstream politicians and clinicians, must be seeing the same thing if they're looking. I mean, as we know, Bill de Blasio specifically said he doesn't want to look. Don't ask. And he said this week that all events are banned in New York except for Black Lives Matter protests. Which, to be fair, is probably fine in New York. It was one of the worst hit places in the world and now shows every sign of having reached herd immunity. There is no new spike there. But then in that case, why ban all the other gatherings? But any of those that are looking in the places that do have a spike, they must be seeing the same thing. But they're pretending otherwise because it doesn't suit the political line. Now, that's remarkable. I mean, that's just beyond belief to me. I mean, isn't it? Am I just being a naive Brit or something? Because it implies to me that the reason we're getting poor quality data isn't just because it was a crisis and things were done really quickly and people were focused on saving lives, not recording data. That was all probably true in the early days. But we're getting poor quality data now because we're scared as a society that the data is going to tell us something that we don't want to hear. Does the disease really target ethnic minority communities? Or is it really because it's targeting obesity and that's more prevalent in those communities? It's an open question. I see the vaguest hints that this may be a factor, but we're never given that sort of data. And because you see them editing the data not to tell the stories that they think might be inconvenient or even offensive to people, how you can get offended by a fact, I don't know, but that's the world we live in. Because you see them doing that, then you do start to ask such questions. It wouldn't have occurred to me to ask those questions before I noticed that data is now sort of the enemy if it doesn't match what you think it should say. Now, we saw an astonishing example of that this week. In the first video I did as the Black Lives Matter protests were sweeping across America and the world, I mentioned the research that showed that black people were not disproportionately likely to be shot by white cops. But when you looked at the data, neither the race of the officer nor the civilian predicted deadly police shootings. It was one of several data points that, taken together, challenged the idea of endemic police racism. The same paper was quoted in an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal by Heather MacDonald. And that caused something of a storm. Michigan State University, where one of the two authors of the report was based, saw the Graduate Workers' Union pressuring the MSU for the hurt that was triggered by mentioning the article in a newsletter. The union targeted physicist Steve Sue. Sue had authorised the funding for the analysis. Giving way to the Twitter mob, the MSU sacked Steve Sue. One of the paper's authors, Cesario, said that this would reduce the sort of subjects individuals can discuss and the sorts of conclusions that individuals can come to. The PNAS journal, where the article was published, produced an editorial suggesting that the authors, Cesario and Johnson, had poorly framed their article. Which is weird, because that didn't come up when it passed peer review a year earlier when it was published. 
but it seems to have suddenly become important now. On Monday this week, the authors retracted their paper. They said they stood behind the conclusions and statistical method, but vaguely talked about how it had been misused. So clearly they stood by their paper, but they couldn't say they were withdrawing it in spite of it being correct, because they were being forced to. So they suggested instead it was being used to support some dreadful thing that they didn't say, that the probability of being shot by police did not differ between black and white Americans. And no, they didn't say that, but then neither did the op-ed that they were blaming. So it's all just a cover, hoping it will be enough to call the dogs off, allow them to stay in position, presumably self-censoring their future work in line with what Cesario himself predicted. That's how bad it's gotten. Not only will we not collect data that may go against the message in case we don't like what the data is telling us, or if we do collect it, we're not going to analyse it, but we will attack the researchers who do look at the data until they retract their own work so that we can pretend it wasn't true. And let's be clear, the United States is one of the countries that's now attacking China because it doesn't tell the truth, because it doesn't allow voices to be heard that it doesn't approve of, because it's so obviously un-American, and I'll say un-British as well, because sadly this is a common phenomenon that we share. And well, why not? Why not allow China to embrace us warmly by the throat, if that's what they actually want to do, because we seem to be censoring ourselves already, so how much worse could it be? For now, at least, the position is that, well, yeah, actually, it could be a lot worse. This week, many of the newspapers and journals have been running streams of features about the awakening of what's going on in relation to China. And it's been growing for some time since the Chinese government passed a security law for Hong Kong that effectively, at a stroke, ended Hong Kong's independence and the one country, two systems approach that was supposed to be, according to China's treaty with Britain when the colony was handed over, to be running until 2047. Why has it come to a head now? Partially because of the ongoing protests that were taking place in Hong Kong, partially perhaps because a time when the world was distracted by the coronavirus, mostly really because China now has nothing to lose. When Hong Kong was handed over to China in 1997, its economy represented 20% of the total of China overall. 20%. It was the wealth creating jewel in the crown for a country that was only just emerging from economic communism. It was the fragile goose laying the golden eggs and the Chinese leadership didn't want to do anything that might mean it stopped functioning. That was then. This is now. Hong Kong today is just 2% of China's economy. China's becoming an economic powerhouse of its own. Right now, it has nothing much to lose. If it decides it's had enough of uppity Hong Kongers thinking they should be living in some kind of democracy with free speech and all that nonsense, then it will just crush them. And if that destroys Hong Kong as a financial force, it can shrug that off now. Obviously, the signed agreement with Britain is being given zero weight. And all Britain can do about it is to annoy China by offering protections to Hong Kong citizens who decide to flee and move to Britain. And China's willingness to throw its weight around across the world is suddenly starting to sink in with everybody. Governments across the world and even the political opposition of those governments. A new book called Hidden Hand has revealed the methods the Chinese Communist Party uses to influence UK elites through what's called the 48 Group, which has been seeking to draw in leading politicians and businessmen. And a new security dossier by Christopher Steele, a former MI6 officer, China's elite capture, supported claims that China uses influence tactics in the UK, developing extensive links with politicians, businessmen and academics to build a presence in Britain's critical infrastructure. So far, there hasn't been specific evidence to substantiate the claims, but there's certainly been a stream of evidence of such outreach going on, with figures such as former Prime Minister Tony Blair, former Minister Michael Heseltine and many others. The UK chairman of Huawei is Lord Brown, former chief executive of BP. He said that Britain risked throwing away its long-standing relationship with China if it banned Huawei from its 5G networks. So firmly on message there, with no concession to the nature of the national issues under consideration for Lord Brown. 
And this is all coming as a challenge to the democratic world, which has been sitting comfortably for decades on the idea that democracy has history on its side, that gradually all people will clamour to join the League of Democratic States and economic trade and political collaboration will become the norm. All countries will respect human rights, democracy and the rule of law, and it will be the end of history. At least the end of a sort of history where people do beastly things to each other in an attempt to dominate the world. It used to be said that the price of freedom was eternal vigilance. And we're now suddenly waking up to how little attention we paid to China's rapidly increasing nuclear weapons and military capability, its offensive capabilities and digital warfare, its hacking and intellectual property theft. I mean, we'd notice those things, but we'd assume that as they became more economically integrated with us through trade and investment, mutual self-interest would be a civilising force. The controversy over Huawei was the tipping point. A state-directed enterprise installing equipment that can be used offensively if that state chose to do so, and every sign that it does choose to do so. In his recent book about his time in the Trump administration, former security advisor John Bolton says that he told Trump that Huawei wasn't China's largest telecom company, as everyone thought. It was basically an arm of China's intelligence services. As Britain began to consider seriously America's exhortation not to use Huawei for sensitive 5G infrastructure, Beijing responded like a playground bully. It said that Britain will have to bear the consequences of making an enemy of China, and said that trade would suffer if the government removed Huawei from the 5G network. Which, if Huawei is not government controlled, as Beijing claims, it's rather remarkable that they care so deeply about its role in the 5G network. And this comes, by the way, as a Chinese company is heavily embedded in building the country's next round of nuclear power stations. And suddenly we realised we weren't economically integrated. We were arguably already, but certainly on the verge of becoming, economically dependent. And when you annoy China, which is very easy to do, by the way, they will use that dependency against you. And so far, governments, corporations, sports leagues, universities have all cravenly given in to the pressure. For example, Angela Merkel right now is under pressure in Germany for still being too reluctant to speak out against China's crackdown in Hong Kong. Senior politicians are saying they should be more like Britain, a concept that's never been stated in relation to any other issue, in standing up to China. So, so far, Merkel has not condemned the new security law. And why not? Well, China is Germany's third largest export market and likely to soon overtake the US as the biggest customer for German cars. And if she's being asked to take sides on the struggle between Beijing and Donald Trump's Washington, since Trump has only ever been aggressive and rude towards her, more pointedly perhaps than to any other leader, with a possible exception of Justin Trudeau, she may not see that as an automatic a choice as you might think. Meanwhile, the US is certainly showing signs of taking this really seriously. The new strategic assessment by the Pentagon promoted China to the top of the list of most dangerous rivals, and US Defence Secretary Mark Esper said that the military is in the process of recalibrating its training and operations to match Beijing's capabilities. Christopher Wray, the head of the FBI, said this week that China is engaged on a whole-of-state effort to become the world's only superpower by any means necessary. So far, China's nuclear arsenal has not been included or constrained in any of the nuclear arms treaties, and it currently sees no incentive to get involved with one. When told by the Trump administration it should join the talks with Moscow to create a new multilateral arms treaty, it said sure, if America's prepared to sink its arsenal to the size of China's, which is probably not what they had in mind. And this is an important thing to remember. America and the West won the Cold War, ultimately, because a Soviet Union that broke itself on the disastrous communist economic policies and therefore couldn't match for US for defence spending and eventually collapsed under the weight of its attempt to do so. Well, that's now been replaced by a smarter and more cohesive dictatorship that has embraced capitalism and is a massive economic engine. We've always been able to depend on authoritarian dictatorships to fall because the top-down repressive model has failure built in. And it probably still does. But if exercised with cunning and subtlety and using the power of modern technology smartly, that conclusion could be decades down the line. At the same time, 
America is chronically divided and distracted and has been hit way harder by the pandemic than China was. Europe is likewise enfeebled with real problems internally as the strains of continental leadership by bureaucracy begin to show themselves. If you were simply betting on the side with the most chips and the most momentum, you wouldn't be betting on us right now. The open question is, what will change now that governments are starting to become alarmed by where we've gotten to? So this is big geopolitics sort of stuff. Not that the rest of us really care about that, of course, because we're having way too much fun cancelling each other for microaggressions to worry about global politics. We're far more interested in getting Halle Berry to apologise for planning to act as a character who's not exactly like Halle Berry, because apparently that's a thing now. Halle Berry, a biological woman, was considering playing a part in a movie because she's an actress and that's supposed to be what they do of a transgender man. In other words, a biological woman who identifies as a man. Not beyond the acting prowess of a Hollywood superstar, you would expect, but no. This is a stretch too far. Apparently, transgender characters can now only be played by transgender people. Berry has also played a mutant in one of her movies with lightning that comes out of her hands and this obviously deprives valuable acting work to genuine mutants. These are the things that people are most getting angry about in lieu of anyone noticing we might actually have some bigger fish to fry. Still, the fact that cancel culture might be a touch on the problematic side has now apparently come to the notice of esteemed figures on the left, not just those on the right. Plus, people like me in the squishy centre, of course. A letter signed by 153 people of note was published by Harper's. It complained about a new set of moral attitudes and political commitments that tend to weaken our norms of open debate and toleration of differences in favour of ideological conformity. The free exchange of information and ideas, the lifeblood of a liberal society, is daily becoming more constricted. While we have come to expect this on the radical right, censoriousness is also spreading more widely in our culture. An intolerance of opposing views, a vogue for public shaming and ostracism, and the tendency to dissolve complex policy issues in a blinding moral certainty. We uphold the value of robust and even caustic counter-speech from all quarters – but it's now all too common to hear calls for swift and severe retribution in response to perceived transgressions of speech and thought. More troubling still, institutional leaders in a spirit of panicked damage control are delivering hasty and disproportionate punishments instead of considered reforms. These are themes that you will recognise if you watched any of the recent videos. It was signed by a bunch of people from the centre-left to the farther-left, Salman Rushdie, Michael Ignatiev, Malcolm Gladwell, J.K. Rowling, Gloria Steinem, Steven Pinker, Noam Chomsky. You get the general idea. All in all, the sentiments in the letter would be considered bland and anodyne in a simpler age. But the letter has been hugely controversial, which kind of highlights why it was needed. And why it's needed quickly became obvious when certain people who signed it quickly disavowed it. Author Jennifer Finney Boylan apologised for signing it because it turned out that J.K. Rowling had also signed it. And obviously, she's been cancelled, so she should never have been allowed to sign a letter opposing cancel culture. Surely. Malcolm Gladwell said that he knew that there were people who he disagreed with who'd also signed the statement, and that was kind of the whole point of signing the statement. But hey, what does he know? One Hamilton Nolan launched a savage response to the letter on the In These Times website. We have entered a brave new world in which those waving the banner of free speech accuse their opponents of being unable to take criticism while waging a histrionic campaign against anyone who dares to criticise them. Well, of course, the letter doesn't at all say anything about people not being able to criticise. In fact, it says the opposite. Take my last video on Michael Schellenberger as an example. Criticism is for various people who said he's wrong and here's why. And there were lots of them. Nobody said that they shouldn't do that. And the fact that they did that resulted in various discussions about the issues and what the facts did or didn't say, which is great. That is free speech in action. And that's different to the other person I drew attention to, who instead of doing that, messaged Schellenberger's publisher saying, how dare you give a platform to this sort of thing? And I hope the children will be able to forgive you when their world is ruined. And that kind of thing. In that case, the publisher told him to sling his hook in a much nicer way than I probably would have managed. 
all too often, that's not what happens. And that's the difference. People have been criticising each other for as long as there's been a political divide, which is a very long time indeed. But this automatic response where a bunch of people now have a go-to strategy of approaching employers, advertisers, publishers, and saying, how do you feel about this despicable thing this person has done? That's the thing. And the fact that the institutions so quickly cave to that pressure. That's also the thing. Within minutes of recording this video, a response letter was released by a group of mostly journalists slating the Harper's letter, criticising the group for being mostly white, wealthy and endowed with massive platforms and suggesting that even though some bad things were happening, you couldn't say they were trends. What's really happening is that black, brown and LGBTQ plus people, particularly black and trans people, can now critique elites publicly and hold them accountable socially. And he then goes on to explain why some of the signatories of the letter and some of the topics of the letter, those people deserved to be cancelled. So, good times. By the way, having mentioned about the video I did this week about Michael Schellenberger, last week he gained a new recruit for his organisation promoting nuclear power. Zeon Lights was the Extinction Rebellion spokesperson who was roasted by Andrew Neil for off-the-wall things that Extinction Rebellion founders had said that she agreed were wrong, but of course couldn't exactly say so on primetime television. It was one of the most shared videos on Twitter at the time. A couple of weeks ago, it was announced she had left Extinction Rebellion and was promoting nuclear power, to the disgust of at least some of her former colleagues. I thought that was interesting and Zeon agreed to talk to me about science and evidence, her time at Extinction Rebellion and why she concluded she had to publicly embrace nuclear power as part of a solution. That interview will be going live on Sunday this weekend. We had a great discussion, so look out for that. Also, the shoe was on the other foot earlier this week. I was interviewed by the Amish Inquisition podcast. We talked about media bias, cancel culture, peer review, pandemics, free speech and a lot more besides. It was a great discussion. I think you'll enjoy it. There's a link to that video in the video description below this one. As always, my thanks to the wonderful people who sign up to support this channel on Patreon over the last week, as well as those who have been supporters over the last couple of months. It makes a huge difference in making these videos possible. So if you want to support the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that this channel aims to provide, please consider joining the growing body of lovely people that already do so at patreon.com forward slash Malin Baker. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.